How did Bolivia go from its first indigenous president to being led by a right-wing Christian fundamentalist? Is this a coup or democracy being saved? We're going to look at the rise and fall of Evo Morales and what Bolivia's future might look like. First, let's talk about how we got here. In the 16th century, Spain colonized the country now known as Bolivia. They forced the indigenous population to mine valuable metals like silver to enrich the Spanish empire, while the Catholic Church set up missions to convert these communities. Even after independence, Bolivia was still controlled by a minority elite that tended to identify as European, and Catholicism remained the protected religion of the state. The ruling class still looked down on the indigenous people and viewed them as backwards, keeping them socially and economically marginalized. While some social mobility became possible in the mid-20th century, change accelerated in the 1980s. After some government-owned mines were sold off or shut down, many miners lost their jobs. Here's the thing to remember. The miners were known for their labor organizing, and some took those talents with them to their next jobs, farming this, the coca leaf. It's a symbol of Bolivia and a part of many indigenous traditions. It's also the raw ingredient in cocaine. The coca and the cocaine production was allowed to counterbalance the crisis of the Bolivian economy. If you know anything about South America in the 80s, you'll know that this was the height of the U.S. war on drugs. In July this year, Bolivia's president, Victor Paz Estensaro, agreed to mount a joint anti-drugs operation with the United States. The campaign was dubbed Blast Furnace by the Americans, who sent in 170 troops to work with the local police. The Coca Growers Union became a major political force. Farmers, including a young Evo Morales, fought back with hunger strikes and road blockades. Morales became the leader of the union and was elected to Bolivia's National Congress in 1997. A year later, he helped found the Movimiento al Socialismo Party, or MAS. MAS was an alliance of unions, farmers, indigenous organizations, and leftist intellectuals. It surprised a lot of people by coming second in the 2002 elections. The party's support grew over the next few years during protests against the sale of Bolivia's national gas company to U.S. corporations. This led to the resignation of the president in 2005, and MAS won the next elections. For the first time, Bolivia had an indigenous president. Morales' socialist policies grew Bolivia's economy while also reducing inequality. While his closeness to leaders in Cuba and Venezuela made the U.S. uneasy, even the World Bank conceded that Bolivia's economic progress was extraordinary. Between 2006 and 2018, Bolivia's extreme poverty was nearly cut in half, partially thanks to a boom in the price of natural resources that funded policies like a cash transfer program for children, the elderly, and pregnant women. The first president I saw since my childhood is President Aymara que realmente está eh, haciendo mucho por el campo y por la humanidad, por todos, no, no, no solo por, por el campo. In 2009, a new constitution set aside seats in Congress for indigenous groups. It also made Bolivia a secular rather than a Catholic state and recognized the country's 36 indigenous nations. Those people felt that the state was with them for, for the first time in their history. You know, and I think that this is important in terms of national or state building or, and national identity. It also set presidential term limits to two consecutive terms. Pay attention to that, it's going to be important soon. Naturally, not everyone was happy with these changes. Land-owning families and the business elite, who feared losing power and privilege, opposed Morales' plans for the constitution as soon as they were announced. A few years later, Morales began facing opposition from some of his own base as well. In 2011, his government proposed a highway that would run through a protected rainforest. Indigenous groups protested by marching to La Paz, the capital. Morales ended up canceling the plan, but brought it back in 2017. Morales had also promised to shift the economy away from resource extraction and towards more sustainable forms of development. But he never actually followed through. Later on, his government even began offering pardons for illegal deforestation in the Amazon. There was a clear mandate 
on the continuation on, on, on following on this extractive strategy because they needed the money in the short term in order to redistribute this money to the population. Now, remember when we said the new constitution limited presidents to serving only two consecutive terms? Well, as Morales near the end of his second term in 2013, he argued that he could actually run a third time. He justified it by saying his first term had been under the old constitution, so he was eligible for a second term under the new one. The Constitutional Court agreed, and so did the voters. Morales coasted to a third term in office. But that wasn't enough. In 2016, Morales proposed a constitutional amendment that would strip away the term limits altogether. This time, voters didn't agree. Morales lost a referendum on the amendment. But the court, which opponents said was packed with supporters of Morales, struck down the term limits anyway. In plain English, they ruled that term limits restrict the rights of voters to choose their candidates as many times as they want, and the rights of politicians to run for office. By the time of the 2019 elections, Morales had been president for 13 years. Would Bolivia give him a fourth term? As results started coming in, it seemed like Morales wasn't going to win outright. It looked like there would be a runoff between him and Carlos Mesa, the second place candidate. But then, preliminary results stopped coming in for 24 hours. When they resumed, Morales had enough votes to avoid that runoff. The opposition began protesting in different parts of the country, alleging there was election fraud. Morales asked the Organization of American States to audit the election result and said he would abide by the OAS's recommendations. On November the 10th, the OAS said the election had, quote, irregularities. Morales agreed to repeat the election. But Bolivia never got that far. Sugerimos al presidente del Estado que renuncie a su mandato presidencial, permitiendo la pacificación y el mantenimiento de la estabilidad por el bien de nuestra Bolivia. The military suggestion that he resign immediately before he did so was in direct violation of the Bolivian Constitution, which does not allow them to express any opinion and forces them to always obey the dictates of the civilian government. After resigning, Morales fled to Mexico, and a right-wing senator called Janine Añez took over as president, with the Constitutional Court backing her claim. She had not been one of the most prominent members of the Senate, but she had already received criticism for her racist tweets, for her anti-abortion stance, for her strong, highly conservative opinions. Añez also waved a large Bible as she was sworn into office in a callback to Bolivia's past as a Catholic state. Añez gave the military immunity from prosecution. Since the election, dozens have been killed and hundreds injured. Añez's unelected government has also threatened to arrest members of MAS. Some security forces have ripped off indigenous flags from their uniforms. Two weeks after Morales was forced out, Añez passed a law to hold new elections. The interim government says it will allow MAS to run a candidate, but not Morales. They've called the former president a terrorist and said he'll be arrested if he returns to Bolivia. While Morales has a complicated legacy, it's undeniable that Bolivia, and especially its indigenous people, made a lot of progress during his time in office. Now this progress, and Bolivian democracy, hangs in the balance.